in the next chapter, uh, you are going to use your previous knowledge on chapter one. We study chapter one on the stress, and then we study chapter two. That is going to be on the strength. In this chapter three, in this chapter three, we will use the knowledge from this two chapter, and we will draw what so called the normal stress, normal strain diagram, and also shear stress and shear strain diagram. And by doing this, it will depend on materials we are considering. Steel, steel has different, different stress strain diagram compared to cast iron, even though these two materials come from the pit iron, okay? And then the aluminum also has the aluminum, the different characteristic of, of the stress strain diagram. Then we know the stress strain diagram for what? We know the stress strain diagram uh, for determine the mechanical property of the material. So by doing this, you guys are supposed to go to the laboratory and laboratory, and then you use the given standard. For example, if you would like to test the steel, steel most of the time steel tests by tension, most of the metal test by the tension test. And by doing this, you got to follow important thing. You guys are supposed to follow the, the, the test standard. In Thailand, in Thailand, we develop our test standard most of the time based on American standard, American ASTM, American standard for testing and material. And since Japanese also has important to Thai economy, we also develop our standards based on Japanese industrial standard. Some of the old standard we also develop based on this standard and based on following standards. We have our own Thai industrial industrial standard. Uh, if Virgo or Donado go back to your country, okay, you got to follow the Filipino industrial standard. I'm not sure what it's called, but uh, that's supposed to have standard. Why? Why do we have this kind of testing standard? Because this material is, are, are, all of them are important for the industry. And also, if there is wrong doing or uh, you use it by mistake, it may cause the failure. And the failure of the structure made this kind of made by this kind of structure will cause some kind of loss of life or loss of property. That's why every country, every country has their own standard for testing the material. And then in SUT, at SUT, we have a lot of laboratory for testing material. You may test the steel, you may test the cast iron, you may test aluminum in the metrological engineering lab, and you may test the concrete in the civil engineering lab, those kind of things. And actually, a uh, mechanical engineering student, a uh, civil engineering student, industrial engineering student, they share uh, the material testing lab in at SUT, we call it material testing, testing lab, laboratory, but some kind of lab may be different depending on the discipline of, of your guys. Uh, 
Okay, based on this, uh, we start our learning of the team. Uh, I just introduce to you the first learning of the team is to understand the stress strain diagram. Lovely, I just mentioned about two of them, and this one. So stress strain diagram, normal stress strain diagram is come from the pension test. And if we have this, this shear stress, shear strain diagram, that's come from the torsional test. It's come from different tests. And then I talking about the material, maybe the steel, maybe the cast iron, maybe the aluminum. Some of you guys may use brass in your, in your, in your factory and some use the copper civil engineering, use a lot of concrete. And then there are the standard that we got to follow. And you should be able to find the mechanical property of the material. For example, if you go back to the cost of the cost of engineering material, you can take the magic materials already, right? It's supposed to take uh, on the first year. Can did you take the aging material cost? Yes, I can. Okay, this is important. When you graduate, can the ME, the CE student will take the engineering examination. This cost is one of the costs that you take it for the engineering license in Thailand, okay? And please <laughs> relate each other courses in order to have this, this kind of examination. Okay, what is going to be the mechanical property of the material when you test the steel basis on the tension? Steel is a ductile material, okay? First part of it is going to be linear elastic, and then it's yielding, and then it's tightening, and then it's going to get necky, okay? This stress then can be indicate some important thing. If you uh, go back and recall it, one of the most important mechanical property is going to be yielding stress. You, you, ding, stress. We use a lot of yielding stress from the first chapter in order to determine the sigma allowable. We have divided sigma sub y by factor of safety. Okay, on the chapter one, Ajahn will give you the sigma sub y and to determine the sigma allowable. However, in chapter 3, Ajahn will ask you from this kind of diagram, from this kind of diagram, what is going to be sigma sub y. The yielding stress is used as the strength of, of material of the steel. And then there is another important thing that we discussed is the slope. When it's linear elastic, there is slope over here in which sigma, the stress, equal to the slope and strain. This slope, we call it the, it is important, we call it the modulus, modulus of elasticity, elasticity. It represents the stiffness of the material, the steel has higher stiffness than aluminum because uh, the steel has higher modulus of elasticity. The steel will have the E of 200 gigapascal. The aluminum will have the modulus of elasticity of 70. 70 chica pascal, that is three times larger. And when I'm talking about chica pascal, you guys know 
what giga is going to be 10 power what giga 10 power mega is 10 power 6 bernardo mega is power 6 giga is power what 9 Ajahn. 9 okay everybody know it it's going to be power 9 that is going to be 1000 times larger than mega and then you're going to understand the hooks law this one that's Ajahn just present this one is the hooks law okay Professor Hooks found this kind of relationship 200 something years ago. And it's very important because Hooks law used to, to develop a lot of standard and code, design code, what's so called the, the design code. Okay, that's we use nowadays. That is very important. This very simple formula. And if you go back, there is another simple formula that's very really famous. E equal to m c squared. See, most of the important equation always simple. The long one, people didn't catch or understand it. But for the short one, or even though summation of f equal to m a, this is for the Newton. He is one of the, the, the most famous uh, science and, and, and engineer uh, of the world. Another one by the Einstein, uh, you know about him. And this is by the hooks, okay, Professor Hook. And then you go to determine the deformation under the tension, okay, if you have the rubber band that I used to hook it for you. I lost it already. <laughs> I don't know where is it. But if you pull this one, you may not see it. But if you pull the rubber band, you will see it. It's going to have some deformation. And when you pull this one, the stress is going to be P over A, eternal force. The, over here, the stress over here will be P over A. The stand is going to be the deformation, this portion and this portion divided by original length and then basis on the Hooke's law sigma equal to e epsilon for linear for the linear elastic that you see this kind this this portion is linear elastic you may put this equation together and then it's going to be this form and by this form you may rearrange it you get the deformation you get this one, the deformation equal to PL over AE. This information, this equation used to determine the deformation of this kind of simple structural member basis upon the assumption of linear elastic. Okay, it's going to be simple one. You're going to study a lot of more complex structure compared to what you are studying over here in mechanics of material workload. Okay, next one. Uh, this one is not that important, but we didn't much uh, asking you in the examination, but you, it's better for you to understand the failure of the material because the failure of the material will cause the loss of life or will cause a lot of property okay so for the engineer we got to prevent 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 the failure one of the method that we use to prevent the failure you guys have studied already by introducing the factor of safety in order to make the structure safe and prevent the failure that is this kind of work engineer must be careful very careful in the analysis and design of structure thinking you are working in a big petroleum industry in Lyon and even though just a while the cause the failure of the pipe the high pressure gas natural gas in the pipe 
may leak out, and then there may be a fire nearby, and that may cause the burst of your industry, and then it may cause the loss of thousand, uh, uh, thousand million <laughs> of 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 uh, uh, the cost of the building, the sculpting. So you got to prevent it. This slide show you the homework. That is uh, the table, okay? This table is the tensile force. This is the log elongation. I'm going to ask you to draw the stress strain diagram, okay? That is the learning objective. And then a dance asks you to determine all of this we call mechanical properties of the material. There are a lot of things I like to introduce you. One is the modulus of elasticity. The second is going to be proportional limit. What is this? Another one is going to be unit stress. Another one is going to be ultimate stress. Another one is going to be fracture or rupture stress. And the last one is going to be modulus of resilience. Guys, I hope you guys know all of this. Or uh, uh, you have you happen know about this. Uh, I like uh, like Kevisha. Do you know about this? Modulus of resilience. No, I don't. I don't know. Okay, uh, uh, let's go to me. So I will teach you the new one. You, you, you know about the modulus of elasticity, right? Yes. Okay, that's just that is in the high school, I believe. And work go. Do you know about the proportional limit stress? Work go. John. Do you know about the proportional limit stress? No, I just... Okay, I it's my so you, you know something, you don't know something, right? That's good. Uh, so in this chapter, you will learn some more things. And after you do the, the, the diagram, and you use the diagram to determine the mechanical property of the material, and then they ask you more, you are going to determine the elongation. You're going to use the equation of delta. The elongation is going to equal to the force times the length divided by the cross-sectional area and modulus of elasticity. This is going to be the E. <coughs> and then they're going to ask you some kind of permanences. This is going to be permanent elongation. Yes, I'm going to talk about this later. Uh, about this is going to be the picture, what you are learning. And then there is the second one. You should you use this, this diagram. This mean over here is going to be the mechanical property of the material. This material is the steel. And the previous one, <coughs> okay, the steel also, <laughs> but different. Uh, Yes, and the last one, we're talking about the aluminum and asking you to determine what so-called the Poisson ratio. We'll be talking this about later. Okay, <clears throat> that is going to be the introduction to chapter three, the mechanical property of materials. Most of the material we are talking is going to be engineering material. And I did tell you about the laboratory. I did tell you about the standard, the mechanical property of materials. Most of the time, again, we're talking about the steel, we're talking about the copper, we're talking about the cast iron. Cast iron is important because uh, it's going to use to build the rail of the high speed train. Thailand has a big project on that, and uh, that is going to be uh, many years, many years project. And then, if you like to to obtain this, you got to test the material 
in accordance with the given standard. The standards is by law or by legal in Thailand. The TAS, the Thai Industrial Standard, backed up by Thai law, and you must follow this kind of standard in order in order to get the legal material result from the laboratory. If there is no Thai Industrial Standard, you may use the other standards such as the American standards for testing and material. I think Philippines also bases on a lot of tests from America because uh, in the past, uh, our economy related to United States of America a lot. But nowadays, another country like Japan, like China also has important. So up nowadays, I recommend you guys to observe some kind of also standards such as the Japanese industrial standard or uh, British standard or the Chinese standard. And most of the time, the standard had the symbol. This is the symbol of the Thai industrial standard. If the steel, the steel, the steel that you produce get the Thai industrial standard, the steel product will have the symbol, this symbol on the, on the material. Like uh, if you have deform bar like this, if you observe uh, some portion of the deform bar, you will get this one. But if you buy the deformed bar, there is no symbol of this. That is illegal deformed bar. You cannot use that deformed bar in the construction of the building. It must have this one. Okay, this one is a symbol of STM. And most of the time, if we're talking about the steel, we test the steel by using the tension. Uh, I like you guys to go to, to my Facebook. Is uh, actually is supposed to be in our mechan mechanics of material Facebook. There is a video. You may copy this link and go to see it. Okay. And uh, let me show you a little bit about this. Uh, let me take this one out and uh, 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 copy this one <laughs> to uh, my browser. Oh, uh, just wait. I mean, just copy this one and put it in. Okay. Okay. And then go to this one. Okay. Uh, let me show you guys about the testing of the steel. Okay. This is the testing of the steel in our veteran testing lab. If you are an ME student, you will test the bar. But this one is for C engineering, so you test the deform bar. So during the testing of this, the machine plot, oh, it's failed already. This machine will plot the stress strain diagram, and that stress strain diagram will indicate the mechanical property of the steel. Okay, if you see this again, the deformation is very small. The load is very large. We use the load cell to measure the load, the tension force applied to this subspecimen. And then you use very high sensitive deformation. We call it uh, LVDT to measure. See, you see this one? Yeah. And before, before it's failure, you will see some large deformation, large deformation occur near this point. Let's see again. See, this one, before it's fell. Yes, see, it's fell over here before it, it's going to have the neck kick. Okay, uh, that's uh, going to be the 
tension test uh, I just show you and if you prefer you may go to uh, the the Facebook and copy the link so most of the time the skill may be test in tension but there is another thing why why still usually test intention that is two reason first most of the steel use use to to resist tension that is the first one and the second one the second one the mechanical mechanical property of steel are similar similar in tension or compression so it's more convenient to test the steel in tension okay and there is a lot of building made by steel nowadays we use cast iron such as in the railway such as the in the layer of the crane or in the uh, instrument some instrument in the mechanical engineering most of the time the cast iron is used to resist compression so different material have different kind of uses and we test the material based on the uses of of the material concrete we use concrete a lot to resist the compression in the column those kind of thing or also in the timber we also test the timber in compression this is the example we test the wood or timber specimen in compression okay we use that the object this is the object to measure the deformation it's going to be the shortening of the timber specimen but uh, this one is going to be the elongation of the steel specimen i recommend you guys to go over there to have the good experience at least to to know how to how know what happened when you test the material okay there are a lot of standard tests this one that's follow the thailand industrial standard that's for the lava this one this one from the default bar this one for hot low and this one for oh sorry so it's supposed to have the ts and then there is <laughs> Another link, if you guys like to see the tension here, this is testing by another machine. The machine that we use to test the tension test is usually we use the universal, universal uh, UTM testing machine. This machine is a kind of expensive. You may see this machine in the Mac metallurgical engineering laboratory in the civil and mechanical engineering laboratory that is the method testing laboratory or in the civil engineering laboratory so by doing this we have this one this one is the instant instant universal testing machine you can find this machine in f6 or if you go to f5 and f4 we also have the universal testing machine this machine very expensive when we bought the, this instant universal testing machine it cost about 8 million bucks this is special because this machine can test not only static not only test in one direction it can take like a dynamic test and then when you do the tension test you put the specimen okay into this machine at the clip on the top and on the bottom and then there is the computer over here over here to use to measure measure what measure the force and measure the elongation that is the lvdt to measure the elongation over here and there is the load 
cell. The cell is over here, usually, and used to, to measure the force. That means the force is going to be P over here, and the elongation is going to be the delta over here. Before you test the material, you got to measure, you got to measure what? You got to measure the diameter of the specimen, and then you compute the area by pi d sub o square divided by four. And also over here, you got to attach the LVDT over here and measure the original length. Okay, so this one known, known, <laughs> known, and this one also known. The P and the delta will be very, very based on the test. Okay, and then by putting this one, <laughs> this one, this one is a special kind of LVDT, we call it x ten so meter. Okay, it's kind of LVDT. Ah, okay, and then you have this one as the L sub O. So you measure two things, you measure the diameter and compute for the original cross-sectional area. And then you also measure the, the original length. And the failure must occur inside this L sub O. Okay? And then when you measure, you measure the load. Okay, the P, you measure the elongation. So when you increase the load from zero, the deformation will be increased. When you test it, increase large load, you're going to get large deformation. And when you test the, who the failure, of the material, you will see in this test, the loads just get higher and higher and reach the maximum over here and then reduce and then it's fail. This is called a failure load. This is going to call the failure load, okay? And then by using the original diameter, you get the cross-sectional area, you divide the load by the area, you got the stress. You divide the elongation by the original length, you get the, you get the strain. Now, you guys has the, the Excel spreadsheet or any kind of program, you may input this into the spreadsheet and you can use the spreadsheet to plot the graph. But in our lab, when you go to the next class, such as material testing for the civil engineering student or the mechanical engineering student, Ajahn, <laughs> like me, like you guys to plot it on the paper. So you may use the engineering paper that you have and you try to plot the result and you will get this one as the vertical stress direction and another one horizontal direction is going to be the strain when you plot it with a proper scale. I just said you use you pass you use the proper scale that's going to come from the engine graphic and then you will get the stress strain diagram. Okay this is also called the rough or big scale. You put this basis on the stand, each of them going to be 0.05 and then 1.0. This is 0.15. This is 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0.4. And if you go over here, that's supposed to be 0 0.45. That's going to be the scale, as I said. And then over here, this is going to be 100, 200, 300, and 400 
you may use like uh, uh, the you have the ink paper right 10 10 10 10 slot as the 100 mega pascal and you can see this is going to be 10 power 6 newton per square meter or it's going to be newton per square millimeter and the unit of the strain gonna be millimeter by millimeter and you use that result you may use it and cut it for example it <laughs> the result that I give you you didn't get this 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 diagram the the result from this one will be appear on the example one so it's not for this one I just uh, use this as an example for computation so you get this graph this is for the large scale this stair strain diagram will provide you only some mechanical property of the steel we use this one this is my steel and then what is going to be ultimate stress the ultimate stress is going to be stress that occur on the top you use your ruler and then you dock it from the highest point of this one okay lovely you can see it's going to be this point this is going to be sigma sub u and then if you plot it okay in the vertical direction and it's going to cut this point this is going to be sustained at the ultimate okay and then this is important when you talking about the Thai industrial standard for the ten for the tension test of the steel, there is four important mechanical property. One is going to be yielding stress. You cannot find the yielding stress basis on this diagram. The second one, you determine it. Sigma sub u. This is going to be the the ultimate stress so the ultimate stress one of the important mechanical property by the TAS must be determined from this graph and then you're going to find the E the modulus of elasticity you cannot find modulus of elasticity here okay and then you also need to find the percent elongation percent elongation of this material this percent elongation is going to be l sub f minus l sub o divided by l sub o is is the length when the material fail like i said that is going to be the property that we took this is the failure load this is going to be l sub f is going to be the failure Length okay, and this failure length is going to minus by L sub O used to determine this volume. So, this one we may determine the L sub F that's going to be the last test one that's occur over here. The L sub F used to determine what determine the stain as failure. Okay, the stand at failure will be <laughs> L sub F minus minus uh, L sub O and divided by L sub O. So that's uh, going to be the percent elongation also very close to, but this one didn't time the 100. For this one, you got to time 100. Okay, and this one going to be sustained at failure for this one and then for the stress you may plot the stress for this one and then you get this one for sigma sub f this is the way you determine it okay this red line and back line must parallel to the horizontal axis this red line and this back line must parallel to the vertical axis in order to determine the mechanical 
property properties correctly and then since the first portion of the graph is so close to the vertical axis so many times we are supposed to draw another stress strain diagram for this portion okay so to make it clearer you use another scale basis of on this we use this new scale that is going to be a hundred times it's going to be a hundred times scale up okay we have now scale up to make this portion clearer and then you use the same data but you scale it by the new strain 100 times scale up and then you get this graph this graph we call it the phi scale okay and then this one use this mean what am x work on what is going to be the proportional limit proportional limit is the is the stress that occur when you put your ruler and you draw a line and then when the straight line separate from the curve okay when you you draw this one you will get this one as the sigma sub pl this is going to be proportional limits or you may call it proportional limits stress okay and then if you project it down if you project it down you're going to get this one and what you get over here is going to be proportional strain this is the symbol that is sigma sub pl is going to be proportional limit and <laughs> this one is sigma sub u that we have uh, ultimate stress and this one epsilon sub u and we have another symbol that's going to introduce to you here this is going to be sigma sub f and this is going to be epsilon sub f that i just mentioned before and the last one we just talking about is sigma sub pl and we have the proportional strain epsilon sub pl over here and following this can you repeat what is going to be the value of this stress okay you must use the proportion to determine the value of this you cannot just guess again i guess this is going to be 250 no you cannot you got to use this one to measure the length between 200 and 300 let's say if i measure the length this one to this one to be 20 millimeter and then the difference over here is going to be 100 megapascal okay and then i do another measurement of this one by using the ruler and i get it to be like 10 millimeter so i will get this one 100 times 10 divided by 20 that is going to be 50 megapascal so by doing this i plus 20 by 50 so my sigma sub proportion over here is can be 250 meta pascal okay you guys understand this right the same thing occur here okay if i measure this to be six millimeter six millimeter basis on this i'm going to get six times 100 divided by 20 that is going to be 600 divided by 20 so this one is going to be 30 so sigma sub u is going to be 400 430 mega pascal you something like this and then coming over here you measure over here to here to get 
8 millimeter. So this one change to 8 is going to be 800 divided by 20. So this one going to be 40. For this one going to be 40, you will get sigma sub f will be 340 megapascal. That is the way we, we determine the, the stress and the strain. We use the proportional method. Okay, Do you like this one. Anyone have question on this? Uh, anyone? Uh, Wallowit, you understand, Adan, on this issue? Because you're going to determine the mechanical property from the glass. Wallowit? Wallowit, Kapom. Kanpisha. Kanpisha, can you catch me? Yes, Adan, yes. Okay, yes, okay, you can do the pop portion, right? Uh, Keng Lee, Keng Lee Te, are you here? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, you, you know how to find the stresses from the graph, right? By pop portion. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, if you catch me, the same way occur over here. If you said, you use this one for 15 millimeter. This one to this one is 15 millimeter. For what? For, <laughs> let me scale it. Uh, we are going to use uh, this scale to determine uh, proportional strength. So if you measure this 15, this one is another 15. That is going to be 30 millimeter. That's 30 millimeter is going to be 0.001. Okay. And then you measure this to be just 3 millimeter. So you get this one, 3 millimeter. It's going to be 0.001 times 3 divided by 30. That is going to be 0.001. Okay. So the value of this, the value of this is going to be only 0 0.0011. It's going to be something like this. Okay. Now, I should go a little bit further to the next one of the yielding stress. The yielding stress is important because the yielding stress specified by the Thai industrial standard. However, the yielding stress has two value. One is going to be this one. This one going to be upper yielding stress. And another one is going to be here. This is going to be lower yielding stress. So if you prefer the lower yielding stress will be very close to proportional stress. And this one going to be the upper yielding stress. That is going to be a little bit larger than the lower yield stress. In practice, you can see the upper reach only one point, but the lower go along with the yielding region. So most of the time we use the lower yielding stress represent the yielding stress of of the steel, okay? We use the lower yielding stress. So basis of all this, we may call it the yielding stress is 250 megapascal. Sigma sub y may be 250 megapascal by this kind of calculation. And then what is going to be yielding strength? The yielding strain will be at the same point. <laughs> it's supposed to be, not this one, it's supposed to start, start at this point. Okay, let me project it like this. So by doing this, if we use this one as the absence of Y, so this one is going to be half of this one is going to be 0. 0.0015. So you got this one. 
as the yield strength and this one is the yielding stress. Next, what is going to be the modulus of elasticity? This is going to be the E. The E represents the stiffness. Okay, the E going to be represent the stiffness of the material. The stiffness is going to be what? That is two words. That's Ajahn told you. One is stiffness. One is the strength. Okay. Strength is the ability, ability of material to resist, to resist the force without failure. Feel the force without failure. That is going to be a simple definition of strength. Okay. Such as this one, as I explained to you guys before, we use sigma sub y as the strength of the steel. Again, why don't we use sigma sub u? Because it's the highest. Because at this strain, the structure elongate too much. So we didn't use sigma sub u as the failure. Okay. And then at this point, at this point, as the ultimate stress point, the property of the material is inelastic or plastic already. So when you when you force the structure to this point, it will not return back when you recover the force. However, at this point, okay, proportional stress or unit stress, at this point, when you stress over here, even though the test over here, the structure will return, will return in this region. So most of the time we talking about the structure, we like it to be to be linear, elastic. Okay, when it's change the shape, it's supposed to return back after recover the force or of the building or of the car vehicle, aircraft, uh, marine structure. Uh, submarine, uh, big boat, those kind of things. When you decide it, it has this kind of linear elastic behavior. Okay? And then, Ajahn, what is going to be the stiffness? Stiffness is ability, ability, ability of material to resist the force. Okay? Without, <laughs> without, uh, uh, not just for, with, with, with some more, some more deformation, okay? The, the material that has some more deformation is going to have, uh, its ability of the material to resist, to resist, to, to resist the deformation, let's say. Just to resist the deformity, ability of material to 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 resist to resist the deformation, large stiffness, small deformation. Okay, and how can we determine the modulus of elasticity? If this one is going to be determined by any portion of the linear of the diagram. This is going to be delta sub sigma. This is going to be delta sub epsilon. Because a lot of elasticity talking about the linear elastic portion. So sigma equal to E epsilon. So E is going to be sigma divided by epsilon. Okay, stress divided by strain. So you may use this one. If you prefer, if we may use this one, it's going to be sigma sub proportion. That is going to be 250 megapascal. And then divided by this one, divided by 0 0.0011. Okay. And you're going to get this one to be uh, 1, 2, 3, 250 divided by 1.1, 1 
this mega pascal change to change to giga pascal so by dividing this you will get the e with e from this to be 250 divided by 1.1 1 .1. that's it 227 to 27 point to 7 giga pascal okay and this is going to determine this one the last one modulus of resilient is going to be the energy 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 that's the material can absorb can absorb during uh uh <laughs> in in linear elastic behavior in linear elastic elastic behavior what so called is the energy is the area under the stress strain diagram okay if if we have this kind of definition so the <laughs> Modulus of elasticity, you call it U sub R. Okay, it's going to be one half of the sigma sub PL and certain sub PL. So by this one, it's going to be 250 10 power 6 Newton per square meter times 0 0.0011. This can be changed to millimeter by millimeter. And then this is going to be uh, 250 times 0.0011. That is going to be mm, 250 times 0.0011. That's 0.275. That is going to be 0. No, <laughs> to, okay, 0. 0.275. And 10 power 6 Newton times meter divided by meter cube. And if you go back to consider the work, work is going to be force time time the displacement. Okay, so force is Newton, displacement is meter, and this work have the unit of June. So this is going to have 0 0.275 and make a June. That is going to be the energy this material can absorb during the linear elastic behavior. What is the application of this? Catching, okay? When you build the steel with the guard rail and is subjected to the heat, okay? When the car hit the car nail, it's going to absorb energy in order the car won't go down the bridge. This is the application of this one. Okay. And application of this, if you select the, the material with high stiffness under a given force, the given force is going to have a small deformation. What the application of this? If you have the high strength material, your section of your structure will be small. Okay, I spent an hour to explain only this graph and explain to you about the important, the importance of the stress strain diagram. That's used to determine all the important mechanical properties of the materials and some of them are legal stuff such as the during during stress such as the the modulus of elasticity such as the ultimate stress and you can see the stress strain that can, can be classified into two types one is door basis on the last scale used to determine the ultimate stress, fracture stress, modulus of toughness. What is the modulus of toughness? <laughs> modulus of toughness, the last one, is going to be the area, the area, the area under the last scale. Okay, 
that is going to be very hard to determine. Again, that is for clashing of the, for example, the car with the guardrail. Okay, this one clashing with the linear elastic behavior, but this one is the clashing to absorb energy before the, for example, the guardrail fail. Okay, you got to determine the area of this whole complex <laughs> graph. Okay, and I also mentioned the important thing when you got the engine license. Okay, you are an engineer, you respond for some legal stuff. The testing of the material is one of the legal stuff to prevent the failure of the structure, to, to, to prevent the cost of life or properties, those kind of things. So this knowledge are important. And usually for written examination, we are going to have one big problem for this one and it's related to stress from chapter one and the strain from the chapter two. Okay, I will stop my lecture for five minutes over here in order you guys will have a relaxed time. Okay, uh, that's a lot of things on this slide and uh, I, I, I recommend you guys to go back and take a look at my video. And Theoretically, <laughs> that's one is this one is from the lab. This is going to be theoretically, theoretically, the engineering stress strain diagram can be can be explained like this. Why a time set is is the engineering stress strain diagram? We call this because the stress comes from the force divided by original area. Okay from the start until the failure. And the strain also is going to be the deformation divided by original rate from the start to the failure. But in reality, in reality when the, the material subjected to the stress reach this point, okay, the area, the area of the steel the area of the steel will get what's so called the naking. When the stress is small, when the stress is not small, the stress is lower than this portion, okay? The area over here still be A sub O. But when the stress is large, when the is large, there is a small not that is the deformation occur okay sometimes the area gets smaller to the actual a but it's hard to measure the area every time so in engineering we keep using a sub o from the start until the failure for the simplicity and also we interested only in the linear elastic region. I will explain to you later. So the deformation could be very small. Therefore, the A sub O, even though the L sub O, the elongation would affect, would affect our stress strain that can match. What I'm saying is we're going to use our material usually only in this region. And if you go back to the previous one, this region going to have very small deformation. Since it has very small deformation, so the uses of L sub O and A sub O is going to be practical, okay? And in reality, is very useful and is simple in practical plus simple. So I first explain to you about this diagram. So how many behavior, the big picture of this is going to be, there is two of them. One in this region, okay, under the curve. Or uh, if you go back to this one, that is going to be 
very small here. That is going to be the elastic region. In elastic region, there is the portion, the portion nearly the end of it. This is going to be curved. Okay. So elastic region can be linear elastic. And another small one is curved elastic. But since this one is small, most of the time we just use the red one to govern the whole region. But you must understand that is a small region here. When the curve, <laughs> when it's curved, the graph is curved, it's not linear. But to make it simple, we just consider all of this region to be linear, elastic. Okay, and then this is elastic behavior. The second one, this is going to be plastic. Okay, what the difference between elastic and plastic? If you guys think, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, plastic bag, okay, over here, plastic bag. When you guys bring the plastic, okay, you can see when you, when you pull the plastic, let me just draw a line over here in order to show you, first get you to understand what we expect for this one. Uh, so let's just make the line occur over here. That is going to be plastic, okay? And if the force that I apply to is small, there is the deformation occur here. Okay, and when I release, it's going back. Okay, move it, going back. That's for some more deformation. Move it, going back, move it, going back. That's linear elastic. However, when I move it a lot like this, what happened is when I release the force, it won't go back. This called the plastic behavior. Okay, as do you guys uh, catch what I'm saying here? Anyone? Did you follow what I'm showing you here? Yes, I did. Okay, go back. <laughs> Just a plastic bag, okay? If the part is small, if the part is small, linear elastic, when it's like, <laughs> that is too much. That is tearing. <laughs> we, we, that is above this region. That is tearing. Okay. Next is the plastic behavior, okay? This is a plastic behavior. It's different one. This one, you poke it, it's elongated. And then you release the force. The material come back to original length. Plastic, when you poke it, it's elongated, okay? When you release the force, actually it's return some, <laughs> it's going to set some, some return and some and some not, not return. I should say that some return, but some not return. When you pull it, it's elongated. And then when you release the force, all return, return back, all deformation, let's say, all deformation return back to its original length. But for this one, some will return, some not return. What not return, we will call it permanent, permanent set. And the question we'll ask you about this later. Okay, I just uh, introduced the permanent set to you based on the plastic behavior. And in the elastic and the plastic behavior, okay, we will separate into four region. One is over here in the plastic behavior, we have elastic region, okay. In the elastic region, in the elastic region, we have two portion. One is the curved elastic, another one is going to be linear elastic, okay. Let me pull this one over here. Elastic region and since the curve elastic is so small, 
So most of the time we consider them to be only elastic lesion and consider it linear. And when you reach this point, okay, this point, there is a point in the elastic region when the stress proportional to the strain. We call this is going to be proportional limit. And the stress as the proportional limit, we call it sigma sub p. And the strain, when we have it over here, we have strain sub pl. Okay, this is the end of linear elastic. And then there is a small curve when you apply the force, okay, the curve elastic. And then you reach this point. This is the last point. This is going to be the last point that the material, that's the material has the elastic behavior. So this called the elastic limit. This is the last point that the material has the elastic behavior. Most of the time we consider this point and proportional limit point the same point. As I said, the curve is small. And then for simplicity, we just consider them at the same point, okay? And also when we move a little bit more, actually this one will go up and down. And we know this one going to have upper yielding and the lower yielding, okay? When the material get the yielding, the stress distance increase, okay? The stress is increased in this portion. We call this yielding lesion. In the yielding lesion, there is the change in the material grain. Okay, the force produces the yielding stress that's large enough to move the grain without increase the stress. So they're going to be elongated without increase the yielding stress. This is important one and usually this one used to be considered as the strength of steel because after this point the structure will deform a lot and it won't be practical to use that structure with large deformation okay and then the grain rearrange itself rearrange itself without increasing the stress until reaching this point. This is the end of the union and the grain is now more compact. Okay, and, and arranges in the proper order and the material can resist more stress again. Okay, and this is going to increase the stress until it's reached this point, okay? This portion is called stain hardening, okay? After the specimen, the material has this deformation or has the strain until it gets compact, okay? And then is can resist more force, more stress. This is called strain hardening until it reach this point. We call this is going to be the ultimate, okay? The stress over here is ultimate stress. The strain over here is ultimate strain. And then, <laughs> you are talking about the yielding strain. Usually, the yielding strain is defined as the strain at the end of yielding region. So this is going to be yielding strain. And then the strain hardening, hardening region. That is the region when the specimen start to have the necking, okay? Passing this, this one is going to be the certain hardening has large lateral deformation, but 
after passing is there is a point okay occur on the specimen that has the naking behavior the side will reduce a lot but over here the side also reduce but not that a lot <laughs> due to this one due to the more song ratio due to those kind of thing the and the naked is not that clear but if you measure the a over here you will plot the true true stress strain diagram but usually they are not much different like this very small different okay due to this lateral deformation this has the lateral deformation and this caused the necking okay i will show the picture of necking later necking the area over here will reduce a lot that's why if you use the air support to compute the stress okay the graph will drop that is two reasons one you use the air support computer stress second the area over here is small so can resist small force that's why when i tell you about this table you get the drop of the force this reach the ultimate and then since the naking since the naking the load drop and then you still use the a sub o to compute it that's that's <laughs> that's produce the the drop down of the the graph okay so this region we call it as the necking okay this is going to call the necking region and this necking region can be seen clearly by this necking and finally there is the fracture occur here this is going to be sigma sub f and this is going to be stated as the fracture okay this graph i explained to you the theoretical Certain stress diagram for the steel, not to the scale. The scale have been considered previously. So this is the Nikki. You can see from the this area that far from the edging. This is supposed to be the original area, very close to, <laughs> if not the A sub O. But if you consider the necking area, this is going to to be small the necking necking is a kind of causing by the sliding of steel grain okay steel grain keep sliding and then this has about when it's fell this have about 45 degree when it has the failure okay the cut will be something like this and this is causes by shear stress the behavior of the steel the failure behavior of steel is straight okay still subjected to stress such as stress cause naking behavior is sliding of the steel gain that is causing by the by the shear stress so the failure of the steel is due to shear stress let me say that the failure of steel steel is due to shear stress Okay, and then finally it's separate into two pieces. And by doing this again, come to the graph. I just explained to you how to determine the mechanical property. Do the determine mechanical properties of this one of my steel <laughs> of my steel do the same way that i 
this show you for the previous slide. I didn't get to 40, the previous one, I get to 250, it's okay. This is going to be the proportional stress. The last point, that's the stress proportional to the strain. So you can be market by putting the, the ruler along the line and then just draw the line. When the curve separate, the curve separate from the line, we call this one is the proportional limit. And then if you project it down, okay, now you will get this one as the proportional strain. Okay. And then this portion, that's called a portion that's go to the elastic limit. Actually, the elastic limit is <laughs> connected to the upper, upper yielding. Okay, you got this one, the number you can determine it by proportional method. Okay, and also you have the lower yielding. And again, let me say, we're going to use this, this lower yielding stress to represent the strength of the material. And you can see from this little graph, the value of this three point, they are not much different. Okay, maybe about just plus minus 10%, less than, less than, okay? And then we use this one to represent it. Okay, and if you go a little bit further, you got to go to this one. This one is the sigma ultimate. That's the highest stress the material can, can, can take. And then if you drop it over here, that is going to be strained as the ultimate. And then also, uh, I forgot this one is going to be strained at the yielding, okay? Strain at the yielding occur at the end of the yielding region. And the last one is the fracture stress. And then when you drop down here, it's going to be fracture strain. So that is going to be the value of the yielding strain, 0.03, based as on the last scale. This is going to be the strain at the proportional limit, based on the five scale. And you can see how much they are different. That's quite a lot, okay? If you put the number one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, this is a kind of scale of 300. This is a kind of 12. That is more than 20 times different. So that's why they use the yielding at this point, at the strength of material, because after that, the structure will deform a lot before, before it reaches the end of the yielding. That's why the lesson that's important to understand. Okay, strain at the end of yielding is constantly larger than strain at the beginning. Okay, about uh, if you use point, point 0.15 for this one, that is 20 times, but if proportional limit is 20 plus time, the design code specify the yielding stress is the strength of the steel. Send beyond this stress, the steel is deformed significantly and the structure cannot function as desired. That's the reason why. And then I told you guys, this is going to be the failure of the steel. This is the failure of the cast iron. They are different. The steel fail subjected to the stress. And then there is the sliding, sliding of grain of grain is failed by shear stress, okay? This kind of failure has large deformation. We call it still as the ductile material. However, 
the cast iron when you do the tensile stress is felt by the tensile stress because it has the separation of of iron cast iron grain okay we call this one as the brittle material because what because the cast iron has very small deformation before it's fail okay so failure of steel is due to the slipping i call it sliding <laughs> slipping or sliding of a plane of steel gain causes by shear stress so it's going to have 45 degree okay failure plane over here which are different from failure of the cast of iron that's caused by the separation of the plane of the steel gain due to the tensile stress and the failure plane is approximately 90 degree okay with the axis okay this is 45 degree with the axis this is going to be 90 degree these two materials are different this steel conductile material cast iron called brittle material that is a good thing of cast iron even though it has the brittle failure the cast iron has very hard surface so most of the cast iron can be used as the layer of the frame as the layer of the crane because the surface is hard when the train breaks okay the surface won't won't fail okay that type material is the material that can be deformed considerably before the failure okay such as the mine steel such as the aluminum such as the copper such as the brass a lot of material ferrous and and non ferrous are the dark type material it can absorb large energy because the energy is going to be the area the area under the stress strain diagram so the that type material has large deformation so it can absorb large energy metal material has very small or no yielding and is going to have small deformation actually we should say that have a very small deformation before its failure such as cast iron just as concrete so there are two big types of material engineering one is that type one is brittle and depend on the usage of the material so as the engineer it is your duty to select a proper material there is another way to to measure the ductile and brittle material is called percent elongation usually the steel the steel has percent elongation in the length depend on high strength maybe maybe just 18 percent but for the for the low strength uh, the percent elongation can be up to 25 percent so it depends in civil engineering if we talking about the steel the steel sd50 okay the percent elongation following the ts is approximately 18 percent okay if we talking about the sd30 the percent elongation can be 20 to 22 percent okay if you have the rush ion the percent elongation may be larger how you measure the percent elongation as i previously know you you're going to find it the final link during the failure okay and then you minus is with the original link and time 100 so actually this portion can call the stain as the failure <laughs> but usually we cannot find it directly okay because at the failure it's really hard to measure the l sub f but we can measure the l sub f after the crack of the material 
And then there is another one. This is not popular, but it's also been used by ASTM. It's called the percent reduction of the area. Now, we call it A sub F. We measure the sub F over here and compute the A sub F. Again, from the D sub O, we compute A sub O. So the percent reduction of the area will have the negative, okay, negative. Usually, the steel that we measure, uh, the percent reduction of the area can be as high as 50%, okay? But the high industrial standard use the percent elongation. There is the non-ferrous material. Non, most of the non-ferrous such as the aluminum alloy or, or the alloy metal has some important property. There is no clear yielding, no clear yielding region, no clear yielding region. When the material has no clear yielding point or no clear yielding region, such as this aluminum alloy, you will going to use the offset method and the TSS. For this one, we will use 0 0.2% offset to determine. What is going to be 0 0.2% offset method that's used to determine it? We have a graph, right? We consider the property linear elastic property. Linear elastic property is the main behavior that we use to decide the structure. So, 0.2% is going to be 0.2% strain. So they said send 0 0.2 divided by 100. That means we're going to use 0 0.002 millimeter by millimeter as the reference. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's going to be this point. Mark this 0 0.002 at the left percent for the yielding point of this one. But we didn't set it up directly. We're going to draw the line parallel to the first portion of 0 0.02, first order of the diagram, of the graph of the diagram. So draw the line that's parallel to each other. And then when it hit this point, Okay, you draw the horizontal line and then you get this one as the yielding stress basis on 0.2% offset. Again, this is the TAS standard method used to find the yield stress of metal that has unclear yielding point, not only aluminum, the high strength steel also. And there is different kind of stress strain diagram. So this diagram is kind of a fingerprint, okay? The steel has different kind of stress diagram compared to the, compared the, to the cast iron and different from aluminum. Each of them have their own behavior. Come to the gay cast iron. Gay cast iron is special, okay? It's failed by separation if it's subjected to tension is failed by separation of the plane of grain, okay? Because of what? Because the cast iron has high, I have a G, high, high percent of carbon. We put the carbon to improve the, the, the harden, the harden of the surface to produce the rail of the train. So, when the wheel of the train break, the surface between these two won't fail. We, we harden, okay, the surface of the material. This material has high, uh, has high harden of the surface. And then when you use it, as the railway, you can see the application of this one, 
there is the force from the train that presses on this material. So most of the time, the cars are on subjected to the compression. And then when it's subject to the compression, things are different. The surface cement this time will compress. When it's tension, the grain over here will open. Okay, that is micro crack between the steel and the carbon. The micro crack will open very quick. So the failure of this iron in the tension is only 152 megapascal. However, when you when you compress this, the micro crack just close to each other. Okay, when micro crack just close to each other, and there is the poor song effect. There is a poor song effect. That means uh, under this behavior, actually, is we have some shortening and expansion, lateral expansion on the side. So the area also getting a little bit larger. So doing that, the cast iron can resist the compression significantly high, like this one. That is about 900, 900 megapascal, six times larger than the failure in tension. Okay, in tension, that is brittle failure. The, the cast iron is a brittle material. However, in compression, there is the the buck out due to the Poisson ratio. So the area that resists the compression also large. And since the micro crack close to each other, that will enhance the strength of the cast iron in, in compression. Another one for the civil engineering student, you use a lot of concrete, okay? The behavior are the same thing. Concrete is the mix of the cement, of the cement with what? With the aggregate. There is two types of aggregate. One is going to be to be sand, is one going to be crushed rock, okay? And then it's going to put into water. The water react with the cement is cause what's so called the hydration, hydration, hydration process. And, and then it's going to bond the aggregate to the cement paste. It's called to cement paste. And then it's hardened by the, the chemical process over here. And again, the same thing occurred. It has a lot of crack. Okay, when you pull the concrete, the concrete material separate easily. It has the low tensile strength. But when you compress it, when you press it, the micro crack will cross to each other, and then it can take very large compression. So Concrete is good to, to, to resist the compression. That's why we use the concrete in the RC column, okay? Uh, we use this as the pavement, P-A-V-E, pavement of road, of road. <laughs> that is the function of the material. We use the material basis on the function of the material. And then different material going to have different kind of stress strain diagram. Following this one, this is the lumber, this is wood, this is a hard iron, this is aluminum, this is going to be the low carbon steel, low carbon steel supposed to, to have this kind of Thing. And this aluminum also has this kind of column. This one is going to be the stress strain diagram in tension. And this one is stress strain diagram in compression. 
And since the concrete and the cast iron is good in resist the compression, as the engineer, you will select the concrete and the cast iron when your structure going to subject it to the compression, okay, such as the compression rod, such as the column. And then for the tension, okay, the steel and aluminum, they are very good. And you can see by doing this, okay, you can determine the yielding stress of the of the steel and of the the aluminum, but it's different. Sigma supply of the steel you can directly determine from the graph, but sigma supply from the aluminum you got to determine by 0.2% offset, and you can see. The strength of the steel is a bit larger than the strength of the of the sigma supply. Okay, and since it have very large deformation, they are ductile material, material. And when you compare the wood and the cast iron, these are the brittle material. From the graph, you can explain this thing. Okay, and then the fracture strength of the cast iron is low compared to the yielding strength of the steel and aluminum. So in tension, the cast iron have lower strength. The wood have the lower strength than the cast iron. And also the lumber have lower strength compared to all of the materials over here. Okay, we call it the strength basis upon this uh, steel still larger than aluminum and, and cast, cast iron and wood and, and lumber. And then if we talking about the stiffness, okay, you can see the one has the highest slope, has the, the higher stiffness and same thing, stiffness and strength. By this club, they are in the same direction. Okay, which material is that high material? Which material is little material? You guys are supposed to answer this by yourself. As I explained to you, which material is properly to be used in tension member? Which material are properly used in the compression member? That's, uh, which material is the stiffest one? That's what you see. Why? You got to get the answer. And the last portion, Hooke's law. Hooke's law is very useful for our engineering analysis and design when we consider the linear portion of the of the stress strain diagram for this one is the stress strain diagram for various steel and you can see the slope of various steel have the same that means the product of elasticity of this material could be the same okay so e is the slope of the stress strain curve in the linear elastic region. And for a given material, they are going to have the same value, the same stiffness. Okay, some Ajahn may call this as the young modulus. And that is for today.